Okay, um, shall we begin with a word of prayer? Thank you, God, for being who you are. And you provide us with things we don't deserve. Father, we are, are mindful that in the comfort that we enjoy right now, that there are people suffering all over the world. Father, their lives are also precious. And Father, we sometimes, things that are out of sight is also out of our minds. But Father, we want to offer a time of prayer that Father, you will comfort them in only a manner that you can do so. That uh, Father, humans, despite their best intentions and efforts, sometimes fall short. Father, we thank you, God, that you love all and father your mercy and grace extends to everyone and father we pray that you will help them find solace and comfort and that you will uh, stop unnecessary uh, violence and that father you will give them peace thank you father that uh, we're here this uh, morning and may we take this time um, and learn and meditate and hopefully we can apply individually our lives in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you for the uh, Cheng Yong for the for, for the prayer and Jonky for the communion sharing. Yeah? Uh, certainly, it's a privilege to uh, speak. Uh, so today, I want to talk about reflections on Psalms ninety. These days, from those of us who are very young to those of us who are older, we are not ac unaccustomed to feelings of isolation or being isolated. After all. During the COVID times, at one point mandatory, and then subsequently, uh, it's self-imposed for anyone who is infected to be uh, isolated. Other times, however, things can happen to us, maybe our relationships, that cause us to feel lonely, lonesome, or abandoned. In the Bible, few have experienced soul-crushing isolation like Moses. At 40 years old, he was a prince in the household of Pharaoh. Yet, in the blink of an eye, he went from the center of power in Egypt to the backside of the desert, where he would chase sheep for another 40 years. A quick recap. Born to Jewish parents, Moses was saved by Pharaoh's daughter, adopted into the royal family. Scripture doesn't tell us much about his upbringing in Egypt, but Acts 7.22 gives us a snapshot. It says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. So with Moses' wisdom and power came before the age of 40. However, his attempt at delivering Israel by himself would alter his life for the next 40 years. It says that when he was 40 years old, verse 20. Uh, 23, uh, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two other Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them. Men, your brothers, why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed him aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? You know, it's amazing in an age before social media. News travel very fast also. You know? They say gossip is faster than anything. Huh? You know, faster than the speed of light sometimes. Um, as an Egyptian lord, Moses wanted to deliver his people. His intention was good, but his method needed correction. Would God be pleased if Moses struck down Egyptians one by one? Well, that's what he thought. Verse 25, right? But his presumptions reflected the wisdom of the Egyptians, not the wisdom of God. Moses would need to undergo a long period of re-education. How long? 40 years. One year for every year he spent in Egypt. And then verse 29 tells us that he fled to Egypt and became an exile for 40 years, herding sheep 
in the Median Desert. This 40-year period would extinguish his self-reliance, making him, the Bible says, he's the most humble man on the earth. And it will prepare him to lead God's people for another 40 years uh, through a different wilderness, you know. Sometimes we think, hey God, you answer my prayer and then be different. Uh? Same, same, but different. Uh. It's a different wilderness. And I sometimes think if Moses had not gone through the 40 years in one wilderness, will he be a fit vessel to be used by God to lead his people through another wilderness? Sometimes you got to go through, we got to go through something ourselves to be ready to be used by God for his purpose. And his purpose may be radically different from what we think he will use us for. Psalms 90 is the only psalm attributed to Moses. And because Moses predated David, it's probably the oldest psalm. We don't know exactly when he wrote it. Like many things in the Bible, sometimes it doesn't matter when it's written. Okay? Some have suggested that it should be read along with Deuteronomy 32. As you may recall, that's the Song of Moses. Others say that it's probably written, a prayer written by him when he was between 70 or 80 years old. Personally, it's got to be written by him when he was older, but before he died. Huh? Because after you're dead, you can't write anything. So it must be when he was uh, way older and he had time to uh, reflect. Let's read it together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, your God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, but by evening, it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning, with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. You know, uh, some say that Psalms 90 was also probably written when Moses was contemplating his own mortality. You know, he's thinking about his own death. Uh, and in his words, he says, God has given man a lifespan of 70 or 80 years. That's most likely a poetic description, not a rule of law or rule of science, right? But this invites us to consider Consider, excuse me, perhaps Moses was around that age when he wrote it. Because you tend to, whatever life stage you're in, it tends to reflect in the things that we're thinking about, the things we put down on paper even. Then if so, certainly Moses at this point had a lot of experience shepherding sheep. He wrote some when shepherding sheep, something that David will also do in the future. While shepherding sheep wrote Psalms. Maybe this reminds us that if Moses needed a time 
of solitude to gain a heart of wisdom, how much more we all need the same. And certainly, brothers and sisters, we know that in this world, there's so much noise that we crave sometimes a time of quietness, right? Can we just... And yet sometimes after being accustomed to noise for so long, we can't stand the silence, you know. What we cannot stand is perhaps what we need the most. And so three points, we're going to try to look at these Psalms in three sections. Uh, the first section, verses 1 through 6. And point 1, in his meditation, he realized that God is the creator. God the creator. Verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. He's, he reflects on God's eternal character and the actions that brought the world into existence. This reflects a truth. God being our dwelling place it reflects a truth that perhaps is comforting to anyone and everyone who feels like an exile. A refuge need not be a place that we run to or build for ourselves because God is our dwelling place. No matter where our circumstances take us. And you think about it, if, even though Moses received a vision of Mount Sinai about God, and eventually he's the one that built the earthly tabernacle, we all know that God doesn't dwell on the mountain, nor in the tabernacle. And even in the future, we know that the temple uh, was built where God's presence was, but neither the tabernacle nor the later temple were truly ultimate place to find God. Rather, they were temporary means of seeking the one who dwells in heaven. The one who eventually came and dwelled with us in the person of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1. And so imagine Moses, he had been taking care of sheep for 30 plus years, or at least had the experience, at least 30 years, 40 years of uh, 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 taking care of sheep. And maybe he had led a nomadic lifestyle compared to where he came from. And all around him lies the, the, the desert and then the mountains in the distance. If you place yourself in that situation, you will appreciate why he wrote what he wrote in this psalm. You know, if I were him, after, no, you know, nomads, they, they, there's no fixed place, right? Because where the, wherever there's grass, they move the sheep to. He probably wondered where is home. Where, where is home? Huh? Where? And then he reminds himself that God is our dwelling place. He had time suddenly to reflect on the, the history of the world up to that point. Now we all are reminded that uh, most agree Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis to is it, remember Deuteronomy, yeah, the Pentateuch. Again, we don't know when he wrote it. But some have pointed out that we can find the creation, the fall, the age of the patriarchs, the flood, and even renewal after the flood in these first few verses of Psalms 19. That, that will kind of make sense. You know? If you are the one that's going to write the first five books, you're going to write about Genesis. Huh? You have pondered about it a lot, right? And it may have come out in other parts of your writing. So you see verse 2. It kind of recalls the creation. He said, before the mountains were born and you brought forth the whole earth, from everlasting to everlasting, your God. And the fall seems to be described in verse 3. Because uh, dust to dust, right? Uh, God told Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you return. He says, kind of like that in the same thing in verse 3, return to dust, you mortals. Verse 4 could be reflecting the age of the patriarchs. Remember, before the flood, Methuselah and his descent, they, they lived for a long, long time. Sometimes a thousand years, you know. Ribo age. So he says, a thousand years in your sight. It's like a day that has gone by. Or like a watch in the night. Verse 5 seems to be describing uh, the events in the flood and events after the flood. And if we were to read verse 5 in the old, in, in Hebrew, it will actually read like, yet you sweep people away like a flood. Zyram is the Hebrew word for flood, in the sleep of death. They're like the new grass of the morning. It, it kind of 
thinks through all the events in sequence. What does Moses' meditation on God's creation teach us? That maybe when we're looking for security or refuge or safe place, we always need to remember that God has the power to create and sustain the world. That God is at work even when we are not. You know, Moses, now as he wrote this as an old man, and maybe he already started leading the people as a leader, he must have made many mistakes and failed public, publicly more than once. See, I think that uh, Moses, like all human beings, he makes mistakes. Uh, when he was building a family in Median, I believe he made mistakes. But those mistakes are kind of private. It's never brought to the fore. I think David would have made mistakes when he was a shepherd boy. Not when he just, not after he became a king, he made mistakes. But before he became the king, everything was kind of private. I think Peter, as a fisherman in Galilee, he already had a quick tongue. But it was not in public who would have felt his, the effect of his quick tongue. Maybe his family only. And so you understand, right? You think about it. Moses was hot-tempered, not just when he was leading the people. His private struggles just became more subject to public criticisms when he became a leader. And so when I started to think, anyone in Moses' shoe, after experiencing criticism by people, will be tempted to either harden themselves or run away. And yet at this point in his life, he's meditating on God. And that God is greater than everything. God is even greater than his achievements or his mistakes. Now, brothers and sisters, if you live life a certain amount of years, you must have to have regrets. And sometimes we live maybe bothered by those regrets. And perhaps Moses is thinking about God being greater, greater than your, the good things you have done, greater than the mistakes you have made, because it's greater than everything else. It's greater than all of our mistakes combined together and more. That may, that may help us to put things into perspective. We're not so great that our effect, that the mistakes, uh, the effect of our mistakes affects so many people. Sometimes the people that, the person that we need to let go of these feelings is ourselves. People have moved on from what you did or said or do. Maybe we are the only ones that have not let go of it. And so I appreciate Moses, instead of focusing on himself, I'm a victim thrust into leading a bunch of ungrateful people. He saw God as the ultimate safe place bigger than anything else. Amen. And then we go on. God the righteous judge. He says in verse 7 through 11. And as you look at the words highlighted in green, this section of the psalm talks about God's anger, God's wrath. In the Hebrew word, there's, there's two separate words, but it appears several times in these few verses. Okay, It's kind of bracketed. You know? It starts with indignation, God's anger in verse 7. And in verse 11, it kind of reminded God's wrath. And even in the middle, it talks about God's wrath. That's the whole thing in context. You know, Moses is not a theologian. But as he looks deeply in and reminds himself of God's judgment, he gains a heart of wisdom. By looking at the death that his sin deserves, he's brought to a place where he cries out for mercy and wisdom. You know, this, uh, as you think about this, he, says, uh, he talks about secret sin. Could he be thinking about the time when he killed the Egyptian, the secret sin that God brought to light? You see, 40 years ago, when Moses killed the man, his failure owned him. But in this prayer before God, Moses owned his failure. And as he thinks about these reflections, he realized that whether our lives are very, very long, thousand years, 
a very short, short, uh, comparatively, like 70, 80 years, it will all come to an end because of God's judgment. Moses, as Israel's leaders, sorry, as Israel's leader, had many opportunities to witness the wrath of God against Israel's sin. Remember how Israel complained and grumbled and rebelled against God and yearned to go back to Egypt, even though God had redeemed them from slavery, formed them into a nation, and provided for them. And God, so God punished all those who had lack of faith. We all remember that, right? And how they would not enter the promised land. In fact, their bodies will fall in the desert. You know, it's estimated that at least one million Israelites perish during those 40 years of wandering. Now, if you divide 1 million, roughly, by the number of days of those 40 years, and it's 313 instead of 352, 365, sorry, because you've got to minus the 52 Sabbath days, they're not supposed to have any burial. You understand? So 313, 365 minus 52, 313, you time 40 years, it's 12,000 plus days. 1,000 divided by 12,000 plus days. It's 80 funerals per day. And if you happen to die on the Sabbath, huh? there's more funerals on Monday. You know? So, okay, a couple of million people huh? right? in the desert. Still, there's about 80 funerals a day. You know? And everybody is linked to everybody, right? I mean, just think about the... You, you're constantly thinking about death. You know, you constantly... It's, it's in your face. And no one likes to attend funerals because it's heavy. It's heavy for you. It's heavier even for the families. And imagine that. And no wonder he thinks about life and death a lot. Indeed, sober reflections on death elicits wisdom. Because if we brush close enough to death, we often find new light to consider life. God's wrath, while frightful, should produce in us holy fear. And such holy fear, as the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. Foolishness grows when we trust in our own strength. By contrast, those who know and meditate on their own mortality find wisdom. Wisdom grows, wisdom grows best in our hearts when we know and embrace our own weakness. So it took 40 years of chasing sheep for Moses to come to this understanding of his own weakness. How does it apply to you? That's something, brothers and sisters, you need to think time, take time to think about. Uh, I don't presume I know how to apply it for you. It's something that we uh, can meditate certainly and think through in our own. Point three, God imparts wisdom. Finally, after meditating on God as creator and judge, his prayer comes to a time where he asks. He asks God, a time of supplication, verses 12 through 17. Moses did not begin his prayer with asking God for this, 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 demanding God to work. Rather, he, he started up pondering who God is. And only after rooting his thoughts in God as creator and judge, is he ready to ask God for mercy and grace. So he says in verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. This wisdom is based on rightly counting our days. And interestingly enough, if you do a quick survey of this psalm, you realize that it deals a lot with time. With time. See, verse 1, it talks about generations. Two, you know, everlasting, everlasting. Of course, chunks, huge amount of time, so huge that the brain cannot comprehend. He says, he just says everlasting. Uh, verse 4 uh, rel relativizes 1,000 years, relative. Verse 6, morning, evening. Verse 9, our days, and years come to an end. Verse 10, common length of life, 70 years, 80 years sometimes. And number tw verse 12, to number our days to gain wisdom. This wisdom should enable us to make use of our lives and to seek God as a merciful redeemer. And I think having an eternal perspective teaches us what really matters 
with our lives and have God's eternal plan in mind. You know, the definition of godly wisdom is to live life with God in mind. Let me say that again. He was trained in Egyptians' wisdom. That didn't prepare him to lead God's people. But now that he lives life with God in mind, he has gained godly wisdom. And that is why sometimes those who have godly wisdom may not be sought after by the world because the world is looking for human wisdom. Teach me how to do this. What's the fastest way to get this problem solved? That's the way of the world. But godly wisdom deals with a totally different um, topic altogether. It's to live with God in our minds all the time. And so the decisions that we make, the things that we say, and sometimes the things that you choose not to say, reflects wisdom. Um, and so I try, I'm trying to th think to end off this uh, reflection. Verses 13 to 17 are five points. And since he says, can we get a heart of wisdom? I like to position these five verses as five points of wisdom. Okay, that's just my, my take on it. You, you, you Please feel free to disagree with me, okay? So five, five sub points here. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Wisdom, verse 3, return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Is wisdom for our allegiance, our allegiances. See, Moses identified himself as the Lord's servant. He seeks the Lord's mercy. As human beings, we're all a bundle of physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual mess. And often, some of our needs go unmet, and if it goes on for time long enough, we'll start asking, how long? How long more must I endure? You know what I'm saying? This year is coming to an end. Maybe at the beginning of the year, you already ask, how long? In times of prolonged needs not met, sometimes we may put our faith in other things that provide, like people, or work, or friends, or savings, or health, etc, etc. But true wisdom aligns itself with God and seek Him first. The test comes when we can accept that all things, whether good or bad, comes from God because we are His servants. Verse 14, He says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And maybe this is wisdom for our appetites. He, he says, satisfy us. You know, we all have our longings. As Blaise Pascal noted, even the man who seeks to take his own life is seeking to satisfy his desire for happiness. The question is, where do we seek this satisfaction from? Moses standing in the wilderness, having to lead real sheep for 40 years, and then to lead the stubborn sheep of Israel for another 40 years, teaches us to look to God for satisfaction. He says, satisfy us in the morning. Indeed, Moses could not have survived if he was not satisfied by God day after day, day to day. You know, brothers and sisters, if, if our morning uh, Bible reading, sorry, if our Bible reading and prayer it's not done in the morning and it's found at another time of the day, that's perfectly fine. Okay, that's perfectly fine. But we got to find a way to enter our day with eyes set on the Lord so that His loving kindness will fill our hearts. You got to find a way to do that. Uh, and have you not had the experience when we're not at our most spiritual and we try to start our day because there's something very urgent or very important, or very urgent and important, like, like most things in life. Sometimes breakfast is also very urgent and important. You rush in, and the things that unfold don't bring out the best in you. You say things, you react, you give dirty look, maybe you mutter something under your breath that sounds like a swear word even. Things that come out of us don't reflect the best of us, and that's not who, who we are. And so God, if God satisfies us in the morning, we don't go into the day a hungry soul, because hungry soul finds satisfaction in idols. 
Truly, the greatest way to find, fight idolatry is to feast on the Lord and His faithfulness. Wisdom for our afflictions, uh, verse 15. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. You know, I put here, pray for gladness. Actually, uh, I make some amendment to my slide. Think of these two words, consolation and desolation. Consolation and desolation. Okay? That should be, have been there. I'm, I'm my, my sincere apologies. We live in a fallen world. And so it's not, not surprising that we experience turmoil from within and troubles from the world. As Christians, I believe our challenges are multiplied because we live in a world that is no longer our own and we choose not to live by the standard of this world. As citizens of a future kingdom, suffering is the norm. You recall in Acts 14, 22, it says the disciples will not enter the kingdom of God apart from some such pains. Moses recognized that God allows us to experience times of consolation and desolation. Though he may not be in those terms. He didn't actually use those terms. Huh? Those terms came later. Consolation is defined as an experience of interior joy. That means inside. Consisting in seeing God's presence in everything. It strengthens faith and hope and even help us to have the ability to do good. A person who experiences consolation never gives up in the face of difficulties because he or she always experiences a faith, sorry, a peace that is stronger than any trials. And if you think for a silent moment, were there times of consolation in your life? Certainly there was. Maybe even this morning. A person in a state of desolation, however, moves away from God's active presence, especially when there are feelings of resentment, anger, ingratitude, self-focus, selfishness, doubt, fear, and then so on and so forth. When one gets increasingly gloomy or self-obsessed, so me, 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 my pain, my pain, my pain, and I'm in so much pain, right? When we're going through that, then I know that I'm in a state of desolation. And so perhaps if we learn to recognize when we're in a state of consolation or desolation, we can respond accordingly. When we're going through desolation, we need to change course. Change course through prayer, through community, through discernment, through spiritual direction. Change. And when we are going through times of uh, consolation to stay the course. And I got to share that um, I try to practice this every day. I try to. Not every day I success, I'm successful and not every day I remember. But at points of the day, I'll try to think, uh, well, just now, were there times of consolation or desolation? And I think that I always can find that in a, particularly, in a particular given day, I go through both. There were times that I feel closer to God and times that my anger, I'm not very Christ-like. But that helps me. It helps me to see that one bad thing, one bad thing that happened to me, I mean, it's always about us, right? Bad thing that happened to me. One bad thing doesn't affect my day for the entire day. That there are times that God allowed me to be close to Him. And I try to practice that so that I want to have a balance this view. So when I come home from work, Joyce asks, how's your day? Uh, generally wonderful. <laughs> then I say, how's your day? Oh, God is gracious. And most of the time, that's what she said. God, God allows me, I, all the troubles, don't talk about it. Lah. But God allows me to see all the good things. I think that's a great way to, of course, that's the ideal situation to start the evening. Eh? And uh, not always is so ideal. Lah. Uh, but there are many times, the more we practice it, the more we find, oh, it's a great way to start the evening. We, we, we don't talk about complaints of the day. Because you know? when would that end? Sometimes when I start complaining, it goes on to 9 p.m. and then she said, I'm very tired already. <laughs> Can we not talk about this? Okay. Anyway, that's me. Um, verse 16. Wisdom for our 
affections. You know, notice that he's asking God, let your work be shown and your power be shown. It's about God's work, God's power. He's saying that he teaches us to look at God and Him. Because if our focus is self-centered, if our relationship with God uh, looks for Him to bolster and improve our works, we will be disappointed. God, help me in my work. Well, how about we look at God's work, God's power. You know, as Moses himself learned, God does not always give us what we want, even when if it's a good thing. Moses did not get into the promised land like Abraham before him and Elijah after him. Moses was one of the countless saints who died with longing in their hearts. Abraham longed to see his inheritance. Moses longed to be in the land. Elijah longed for spiritual revival. None of them got to see all that. Moses, however, does not pray for his own success, but prays to see God's glorious work display. You know, there's much wisdom in this prayer. For God loves to reveal His glory to those who ask in faith. Somebody said that uh, Christianity is not a system of belief that helps us to self-actualize. In other words, it's not slowly, slowly you recognize your talents and gifts and you slowly self you put confidence in yourself. It's not that. It's God actualized. That the older we get, we become less. And God becomes more. God becomes so much more that we're willing to give up our own dreams. So that God's dream is the biggest thing and occupies more and more of who I am. Amen? Maybe for those of us who are younger, that's kind of hard, a hard pill to swallow. Now. What are you talking about? But you know, as you get older and older, older and older to the 70, 80 years of the uh, natural human lifespan, you, you think God has to be bigger. Lastly, wisdom for our achievements. He prays that God establish the work of our hands. And that maybe, brothers and sisters, as we get older, we need to hold on to our works with a very light grip. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. If anything goes well in our work, it's grace. Here Moses asks, not demand, for God's favour to be upon him. He did not treat his work as secure in themselves. Instead, Moses asked God to confirm the work of his hands. In success, we should remember to give praise. In failure, we should content ourselves in God and the refuge he gives us. This sort of God-centred way of life is the beginning of wisdom. So let me conclude. In these strange days of this nascent group, God is still at work, accomplishing His eternal plans. Let's not lose heart in these days. Therefore, and instead we continue to do what Moses kind of said in Psalms 90. May God grant us godly wisdom to trust Him and to walk in His ways. Let's be thankful for God's grace. Uh, as someone once said, we need grace to see not only how Christians can make mistakes, but how mistakes can make us better Christians. Let's keep close to God to ask for a heart of wisdom by learning to number our days. Thank you.